For people who don't know me, I'm Tom Beyer. Um, I'm the Director of Platform Services here at PubFactory. Hi, I'm Heather Staines, the Director of Partnerships for Hypothesis. This is the uh, agenda for the webinar, um, and we've done our introductions, um, but, and we'll start with a little bit with um, what PubFactory is and why we are partnering with Hypothesis. So we're a, a publishing platform. We host um, a lot of journals and books, uh, mostly in scholarly publishing. Um, and we have this sort of ongoing effort uh, to um, invest in things that will increase our user engagement um, and enhance uh, content pres uh, presentation. And we think that Hypothesis are, is a really exciting um, tool uh, that really uh, goes a long way in, in, uh, in helping with those efforts. And as we hope to demonstrate, to, to implement, um, at least at the, at the initial level. So um, just a little bit of, you know, a Hypothesis, it, they're an open source and nonprofit uh, organization um, and have this industry-wide annotation uh, infrastructure that's really, uh, that we hope you find really cool. Um, and, and as part of the platform, we're always looking for these kinds of third party tools because um, we want to be able to give our publishers as many options as possible. So just a little bit um, about Hypothesis, and then I'll do a quick um, demo for you from the researcher's perspective. So as Tom mentioned, um, we are a mission-driven nonprofit. Um, we are open source and strong believers in standards. Um, we started working with publishers a few years ago. Um, until now, most of our researchers have been, most of our annotations have come from the researcher and the education space. You can see some of our funders um, along the bottom of the screen. Um, one thing to note, uh, about a year ago, uh, February 2017, the W3C, the standards body for the web, formally published um, the annotation as a web standard. So what does that mean? That means in future versions of browsers, uh, just like you tell your browser what your default search engine is, you should be able to tell your browser which annotation client you're using. And if multiple annotation clients use the same standard, um, we should be able to work together. My annotations using one client, your annotations using another, should be able to interact with each other. I, I need to update this slide. Just yesterday, we passed 2.5 um, million annotations. Um, about a quarter of those are actually um, completely public. So if you get a free Hypothesis account, um, you can actually surface these public annotations that have been made across the web. Um, we have a lot of annotations that are made in private collaboration groups, and we're keen um, as the publisher functionality launches to start to be able to track that as a separate um, user segment as well. Um, just a little screenshot of how the sessions and hypotheses play out around the world. Um, not surprisingly, a lot of the sessions take place in English speaking countries. You can see they're on the left, the US, the UK, uh, India, Australia, Canada. Um, but we're really excited if you look through the long tail to see users um, really across the globe uh, from South America to the Middle East to Asia. And we're excited to see how this will grow as annotation uh, proliferates. A little bit about um, how Hypothesis works before I jump into the demo. Um, we think of annotations um, in layers. Um, hypothesis annotations are created to anchor onto the publisher uh, content itself so that the conversation doesn't have to be taken elsewhere, uh, for example, to Twitter or a blog post. Um, and you can have multiple layers of conversation um, happening across the same document, depending upon what you've actually come um, to the page to do. So there may be one conversation taking place in a public annotation layer, um, a private conversation taking place uh, for a class. Uh, publishers are also using um, annotation to create additional content um, to expose uh, commentary by experts, for example, or notes from authors. Um, and I have some um, use case slides which will go a little bit more into that as an example. So let me just um, jump out of this and into my demo. So you should see um, in front of you on the screen um, some content uh, that is hosted on the Pub Factory platform. Um, in this case, um, from Edward Elgar, uh, Edward Elgar Online. Um, this is an open access um, article. I'm actually bringing, uh, at the moment, uh, this view is actually bringing 
the Chrome extension um, to the browser just to show you how a researcher um, can work on content today. And this, as I mentioned before, you can get a free account and, and you can actually start um, to try this out for yourself. So this is an article that I was looking at earlier, the Declaration on Human Rights and Climate Change. Um, when Hypothesis is not in use, it's simply hanging out here on the right side of the page. Um, just close that back up for a moment. So as a researcher, um, as I'm going along and I'm looking uh, at stuff and I find something that I want to take a note of, I simply highlight the text uh, that I want to make an annotation on. Hypothesis will ask me if I want to uh, highlight or make an annotation. So I've, in this case, I've selected annotation and I can just start. This is interesting. I can tag it uh, climate change, maybe human rights. And then Hypothesis will ask me if I want to keep it private just for me or if I want to post it to the public uh, for anyone to see. So I'll post it to the public. Now I have an annotation that's actually stuck to this particular piece of text um, on the Edward Elgar page. Um, I can share this annotation through various types of social media. I can email someone the link. And the person that I share the link with doesn't have to have a hypothesis account. They don't have to know that it exists. If they can get to the content, um, it will actually uh, pop open the client and scroll them down to the annotation. So it's a great way to share information with folks that you are working with. In addition to choosing between a public facing annotation and one that's completely private just for me, I can create a collaboration group. Just select a little arrow next to uh, public. I have a lot of groups and you can uh, select the tab to make new group. Hypothesis will ask you, what do you want to call the group? So let's call it uh, human rights group. And I could put a description in there if I like. Uh, and it's just that simple, the group is created. Um, this is my group dashboard, um, every group has one. You can see when the group was created, who the individual members are, and you can invite new members um, using this clipboard link. Now, I'll just um, highlight that this is how um, invitations work in a private group. Um, the, some of the things we're building for publishers are a little bit more formal with email um, invitations and dashboards to manage members and the like. So if I go back to my original article, I can just continue reading along. I come up with something else that I think that I want to make note of, um, I'll just go ahead and select that text. Instead of making my annotation in, in the public layer though, let's see here. Oh, I just need to refresh to get my group to come back, just a second here. When you have a lot of groups, um, they can start to stack up. So let's just wait here until um, everything opens up again. And I will go ahead and find my text. If this opens, Let's see what I had wanted to take a note of here to annotate. And let's hope my human rights group has appeared. There it is. Sorry about that. Um, and so now I can make an annotation that's aimed at members of my group. So learn more about this. Again, I can add tags, human rights, climate change, um, and I can post it. Now within a group, I can still make notes that are private just for me, uh, but in this case, um, I'm sharing it with members of my group. Um, so someone who comes to the page who's not a member of the group, they won't know the existence of the group. Um, they'll only know about it if they are a part of the group. Um, but they can um, see this annotation and they can actually come in and respond to me. So thanks for sharing if I can type. And in addition to supporting text, um, we support um, full markup. So let's say that this was um, an, an article about human rights and climate change that was talking about um, carbon footprints, for example. I can go ahead and let's say I needed to add a mathematical equation um, and kind of get math and I can post it. Now I've got a mathematical equation um, as part of my annotation. Um, similarly, we support um, images in rich media within the annotation pane. So let's say I'm taking a look at an interesting um, video about climate change and human rights and I'd like to drop that in 
uh, for my group um, to see. I can go ahead and include that. And you can play it from right in the browser. So this is an example of a detailed threaded conversation that's happening um, right on top of one sentence on the publisher content. But you can also connect content across the web. So I was looking a little earlier at the Declaration on Human Rights and Climate Change um, as published as part of the, um, the, the UN. And I can actually take my group with me. So let's say there's something here um, in the document itself that I wanna take note of. Um, and I can put this uh, in my human rights group as well. And I can say, check this out. I get human rights, maybe UN, and I can add that to my group. So other people in the group will be able to see that. I can also grab from the clipboard the link for that annotation, go back to the original one I made on our first article and add um, some information here. Also check out this article and behind this, I can drop in the link. Um, so now I've got two articles that are linked across the web. I can also annotate on certain types of data if it can be viewed um, in the browser. Um, this is uh, actually a, a, a CSV file about earthquakes, so not precisely about climate change, but forgive me there. So I can actually select um, a cell in this um, CSV file and I can pose a question to my group. It's right, I can tag it data. And then um, I can go ahead and put that in my human rights group. And then someone else um, in the group can come along and answer me. So for anything where you need to ask each other detailed questions on top of content, it's a great way to work. Now, if I go back to my group dashboard for my human rights group and actually refresh that, you'll see that all of the annotations I've been making um, across the web um, automatically appear here. I can get back to any of my articles in context by clicking on this arrow, view annotation in context. I can see what other members, uh, if there were any of the group are working on. And those tags that I've been creating um, are great for filtering. So if I only wanna see the articles that I have tagged uh, UN, I can add that to my filter at the top. Um, so as a, as a research um, tool, it's, uh, it's, it's incredibly powerful. Um, if I remove the different filters here from the search, what I'll have access to is all of the publicly visible annotations that Hypothesis users have made across the web. Um, it's always really interesting to come in here. Um, you see a lot of um, students uh, annotating, and if you find an annotation that's interesting, you can explore other things that um, that uh, annotator um, has put together. I come in here and find annotations in Chinese, Japanese, uh, Arabic, um, uh, lots of cool things. Um, so the public, these publicly facing annotations are fed into the Crossref events data project. Um, also every user of Hypothesis gets what we call a profile page. So if I click on this, um, I have my own page, uh, access to all the annotations I've made anywhere on the web. Um, you can see the annotations that I added as part of the demo here. Uh, in November, I annotated, I, I moderated a session at Charleston that was on artificial intelligence. So I can simply select the articles that I've tagged about artificial intelligence. Um, it'll add to my filter. I can see um, all of the notes that I made to myself. I can share them um, with my panelists. So it's pretty um, nifty from a use case perspective. So what I thought I would just do is, is since uh, Heather showed all of the sort of cool things that you can do with, um, with Hypothesis, I thought I would just show you how easy it is to actually add it into the Pub Factory platform. What we're looking at here is just a, a, a regular article. It's also one uh, from uh, Edward Elgar, uh, one of our publishers. And as you can see, there's, there isn't the, the little annotation widget that um, Heather was using uh, for Hypothesis. Um, but, and when she was showing it, she had basically used a, a Chrome extension, but we can actually add it to the platform um, so that it always comes up uh, for your content um, and, and allows you access to, to all the functionality that she was showing. So what we're seeing here is our, um, our page layout uh, uh, editor in, in Pub Factory. And if I wanna add um, hypothesis as a, as a feature to the layout, it turns out that there's a, 
simple little bit of uh, JavaScript that I need to uh, put into the template. So Heather had given me the, the, the key, the key uh, line of code that I needed. It's, as you can see, it's super simple. Um, so I, I created a little static uh, block to, to add to the page. Um, if we just save that and then come back to the, um, the uh, article layout page here. Um, if we just drop that static block onto um, the layout, we grab the hypothesis one, say save. And now when we come back to this page, if we redisplay, we should see um, that the hypothesis tool appears. Here we see it up in the corner. And now if we come down and annotate some content, we immediately get the full um, hypothesis interface and I'm, I'm already logged in, but again, we'll have access to all of the functionality that, um, that Heather just showed off. And so you can see it's just super easy to uh, add to the platform. This is now, basically this will now appear on all article pages um, in the platform having done Having, having just dropped it into the template. Um, so at, at, the, at this sort of top level, it, it's really easy to, to add. Um, and we are of course interested in deeper integrations and Heather's gonna talk, talk a little bit more about that and the kinds of things that are possible uh, with, with deeper integrations. So now I'm gonna hand it back to Heather. Great, thanks so much, Tom. It's really cool to see. I don't always get to see from the developer side. Um, I just wanted to uh, just have a couple, um, a couple more slides and I'm going to jump into use cases. Um, the uh, annotation um, dashboard functionality that I showed for you can be set um, uh, at an individual user level, it can be set um, at a journal title level, a collection of um, content on the same uh, topic, or it can be publisher domain wide. It's very flexible. Um, we have a very robust um, API that's available now. Um, there's lots of things that you can do. Um, with the API, um, you can, uh, it's pretty, uh, pretty simple here, but what some of the interesting things are you can use it for text and data mining. You could repurpose it on your website, for example, have interesting annotations uh, deliver uh, yeah, elsewhere to kind of promote your content. Um, and there's full documentation available for the API. Um, so in addition to the uh, integrating the Hypothesis client, which is the um, simplest integration and um, because we're open source, uh, it's free. Um, we have what we call customized hypothesis that we will um, work with you and, and if Club Factory is your host, um, you know, work with them to enable for you. Um, we can talk a little bit more if you're interested about um, how pricing works. We can connect to existing publisher accounts. There's certain um, branding and, and moderation uh, that's available. Um, we can customize to fit your AI and we work with you on a rollout program. Um, here's an example. Um, have some functionality around in for, for publisher groups. Understandably, if publishers are going to have annotations and information that live on top of their content pages, um, they want to make sure that it's going to uh, be within their control. Um, so I've showed the multiple layer um, scenario before. Publishers can have, for example, one layer that is a general discussion, um, another layer that's restricted um, just for authors, and you know, maybe another layer that shows review summaries. It's, it's completely flexible publisher can decide who can create annotations and who can read them. Um, if there's an issue with one of the annotations, uh, a reader can flag it It will go to the moderator um, for their further review and, and perhaps if they need to, they can take, they can hide it or take action um, against the annotator. Um, we're also supportive um, uh, when we we'll work with you. Um, uh, my, one of my colleagues, Nate Angel from marketing is, is on uh, with us here today. Um, we want to, we always want to talk with publishers from the outside to find out what they hope to achieve by adding annotation to the site. And that could be a number of things. Um, we offer um, training. Uh, if, if you implement a free hypothesis version, we're still happy to um, offer training and um, promotion on, on your behalf. Um, and we'd love to, you know, work with you both in conferences and putting together case studies, etc. So um, uh, Tom and Michelle asked me to talk a little bit more detail about how Hypothesis is being used. 
Um, so I've put together a few slides. Um, probably the thing which um, pops into people's heads most readily when they, when they think of annotation is um, some sort of a, a discussion layer that's happening after content is published. Um, and we definitely do see um, a lot of this happening. Um, uh, interactions with authors, interactions um, with, with collaborators who are researching their own article um, and the like. Um, it's having a, this, these conversations right on top of the content um, seems to be you know, very effective in keeping uh, users on site and increasing stickiness, for example, um, as well as meaningful interaction on top of your content. Um, we're doing a lot of work uh, with the preprint space. Uh, preprints are really designed for collaboration. Um, and uh, of course, um, the results of that collaboration um, may be published. So uh, having uh, information flow through into manuscript submission systems and ultimately perhaps be connected with the final published version of works. Um, here's an example where um, an author has annotated her own paper. Uh, to provide additional updates and information. Um, editors could also provide updates, marketing departments could provide connections to media mentions um, and the like. Um, just another screenshot of um, uh, an example of publisher and institutional layers. The way that we've created Hypothesis is um, to allow the client, which is the browser piece of the tool to be separated from the annotation server um, and eventually to be able to talk to multiple servers if that is how the user desires. So this is just a little example of an instance where we have um, annotations happening in a publisher space, uh, for example, eLife, um, also uh, happening in, in a number of public and, and private groups. But let's say I'm a researcher for a pharma company and I'm working on um, R&D and I need those annotations to be absolutely secure behind my company firewall. So depending upon what I've come to this page to do, I can direct my annotation there to the appropriate layer. Um, I mentioned uh, manuscript submission systems. Of course, there's a lot of interest in annotation around peer review. Um, E-Journal Press um, integrated Hypothesis into their uh, GEMS platform. They trialed um, last spring with um, a few of the AGU journals and then did roll out across all AGU journals in September. And my understanding is it's, off, it's being offered to anyone who uses um, e-journal press for um, manuscript uh, submission. We're also in conversations with other manuscript submission services. One of the uh, things that I think is, is, is the coolest use case um, uh, around hypothesis is around uh, automated annotation of entities. Um, you may or may not have heard of something called an RRID. It's a research resource identifier. Very, very critical for reproducibility purposes. Um, if you need to know which stem cell line was used in an experiment or where a particular reagent was purchased. Um, at least 125 journals in the neuroscience space currently use these RRIDs. Um, so they're, they're, they're widely used. Um, a group out of University of California, San Diego created a tool using hypothesis called Cybot. So if you open up a paper, if you have hypothesis and you open up a paper, uh, either HTML or PDF version, doesn't matter, the, um, the tool looks for these RRIDs. You can see them here highlighted here. They're a combination of um, letters and numbers. And it pops up information from a number of external databases along the side of the article in the form of annotation cards. So you don't need to navigate away to find out that information. It's a combination of auto-generated and human curated. Um, if there is an issue with one of these RIDs or it doesn't resolve or you want to ask a question about connecting it to text, you can use the reply function and get in touch with someone at the project um, who will help you. Um, another project we're doing is uh, we kind of refer to it as illuminated footnotes. It's with Syracuse University Qualitative Data Repository. Um, and they're actually working with a number of um, projects in the social sciences to connect up footnotes with their original source material in the form of annotation cards. So in the event that the footnote or endnote um, does refer to a specific snippet of text or a particular fig figure in an original work, um, that information can be available via an annotation card. Um, more information can be added, you know, translations and the like. Um, we have a workshop um, with them in, in February, and this should be visible to the public um, later this spring um, with the collaboration of Cambridge University Press. Just a few more. Um, journal clubs, uh, highly used. Um, there's some, actually some great uh, uh, groups out there who are trying to put together 
um, toolkits um, for best practices uh, for journal clubs. And we're happy um, to see hypothesis included as part of that. Um, as I mentioned in the, in the metric slide, um, private groups are um, a key driver for the creation of annotation. Um, so it's great to see that here. Um, is, a, is a screenshot from graduate students at the University of Texas at Austin um, having a little journal club on top of a University of Michigan Press book. Um, holding the media accountable. Uh, I've referred uh, to experts um, creating annotations that become part of content. Um, we've been working for a couple of years now with a group called Climate Feedback. Um, it's organized out of um, University of California. scientists around the globe. Um, and whenever an article comes out, it might be the mainstream media, it might be a scientific publication, they distribute it amongst themselves according to their specialty. Um, they do a couple of things. They give the article a credibility score. You can see here on the right, this one has a, unfortunately a low credibility score, but there's certainly articles that um, you know, run the range there. And they do inline annotation to look for information that might be out of context, um, incorrect, and, and more importantly, they provide links to better information. So we're working with some other communities annotating in the public interest um, to expand upon this climate feedback example. If you're interested in maybe exploring something like that with some um, uh, of your authors or your journals, um, just let us know. And finally, um, annotation in the classroom. Um, our, uh, our annotations seem to rise and fall like clockwork in conjunction with the semester now. Um, we have an integration with the Canvas Learning Management System um, that's being tested now at a number of schools. Um, professors are assigning close readings and collaboration projects. It's a proven, there are proven pedagogical examples of how um, students working together in a group um, improve the outcome for all of them. And with the hypothesis technology um, and the creation of private groups, the instructor can see what all of the student annotators are doing, what they're getting stuck on and the like there. So we're really excited to watch that um, as it progresses. Uh, last slide, I promise. Um, these are some few, a few interesting use cases that I've just heard about in the past six months. Um, there are a group of um, publishers at uh, Springer Publishing, um, actually production uh, team that has put together a group to annotate right on top of their XML staging site. Um, so that was, I thought, a, a pretty cool uh, use case. Again, if you can view it in your browser and you can select it, you can annotate it. Um, there's another um, set of publishers who were doing a big migration project within their platform host and they knew that a number of landing pages were going to have to change. So they made a group um, with Hypothesis. They asked each other questions on top of those pages and made note of the things that we need to change. Um, we have editorial and sales groups uh, working together. If sales is doing a campus visit, editorial can um, mark up a number of um, articles, important uh, authors who might be on campus, important specialties um, that those uh, sales colleagues might want to reference. Uh, and uh, even folks who are annotating back and forth um, with each other on invoices, the CSV file example that I showed, um, rather than endlessly emailing uh, invoices back and forth and saying, hey, you know, column, column C, row 23, what do you think about this? You can actually select it, ask someone the question right on top of the content. So we'd be curious um, of other use cases that you might think of that we could add to a future presentation. And that is it uh, for me. So um, we can open up to questions. I know before I uh, started talking before there, there were some. So Nate, um, if you can manage questions. Yeah, so we, you know, uh, Michelle and I have been answering some by text in the background, but I think it would be helpful if uh, you and Tom both talked a little bit about, um, you know, uh, who would actually implement Hypothesis into a Pub Factory publication, um, and that we answered by text already about it, but just to clarify who would do that, and then also how it might work with um, the uh, Pub Factory base app annotation capability, and if they're one should use one or the other or both, or how they might interact. Um, those are a couple of the questions that we tried to address by text, but it might be helpful to to talk about it on screen as well. And then we also, after that, Heather, if you could talk a little bit more about the cross-ref relationship to the annotation data and go into a little bit more detail about what happens there. Tom, you want to kick off? Sure. Um, so yes, the Pub Factory does have its own annotation technology um, that uh, we built long ago. Um, 
And some of our publishers are using it and, um, and some are using it extensively. But um, what, what we liked about Hypothesis is the, is the um, sort of industry standard and uh, nature of it and the fact that it's uh, really working across, uh, you know, it, it allows for annotations that, that span all over the internet, um, as Heather showed. So um, I, I think, you know, over time, um, we may uh, decide to phase out our own internal implementation. Um, another, another reason why I was initially quite intrigued with Hypothesis is one of the things it does is it is able to match up annotations across both the HTML and PDF versions of your content. And that's something that we had never quite gotten to with our own implementation. And, I, and for publishers who are publishing a lot of PDF content, um, that's a really nice uh, and, and pretty key feature uh, to have. So, uh, you know, just in terms of forward looking capabilities, I think it's um, interesting. I think for end users, you know, we would probably um, uh, counsel our publishers to choose one or the other annotation technology. I think it's probably confusing if there's multiple technologies in place on a single platform, um, but we're happy to work through the implications uh, of that. Um, and in terms of who does it, um, for those publishers of ours that are using the layout editor that I showed, uh, it's, you know, you, you don't need us to turn on Hypothesis. You just need that little magic piece of um, JavaScript and, and it turns on. Um, so, in, in, so for those publishers, they can absolutely turn this on whenever they want. Um, for other, other publishers, we'd have to just, you know, um, update the templates to, to include the hypothesis link. Um, for the deeper levels of, of integration um, that Heather showed, you know, we would want to work with, with you, the publisher, and with Hypothesis to come up with, you know, exactly what you want to do, what's the use case you're trying to solve, and how best to do it. Um, and then, you know, work that out as a, as a little enhancement project uh, to, to the existing platform. So I think there's a, you know, there's a lot of different opportunities and I think there's opportunities for getting in very easily and cheaply and then sort of expanding um, as you go. And just to fully clarify that, Tom, um, when annotations are made through Hypothesis, they're not also stored in the Pub Factory native annotation capabilities, is that right? That's right. They are two entirely separate repositories of annotations. Got it. I, um, would, um, I would just mention that we, we do work with publishers who have had annotation capabilities um, available uh, before. Um, and so in, in some cases, it's a pretty straightforward mechanism to kind of uh, build a little tool that would bring those annotations over. So if you do have a lot of annotations that you wouldn't want to lose, it's certainly something that we can discuss. Yep, absolutely. And I, and I think we would probably, if, if we were working with a publisher that has existing annotations and wanted to move to Hypothesis, we would definitely uh, do what we can to make that as easy and painless as possible. Um, so I'll take the cross-ref question. Um, so uh, in uh, May, I think it was last year, May or, or, or perhaps early June, the cross-ref event data project um, launched. Um, and annotation is one of the items that Crossref had identified um, that, that they wanted to be part of that. So um, again, using the API that I mentioned, we were able to feed um, information to Crossref um, on those publicly visible annotations. Um, and so uh, as the Crossref event data project is indexed by Google, um, those publicly visible annotations will be discoverable um, uh, via, via Google as well. So for publishers who are interested in having, um, you know, yet another channel uh, to, uh, for users to find their content, um, you know, that is a great way uh, for that to happen. So we're excited about that. Um, another piece of news in the, in, in the Crossref camp, um, in the fall of uh, 2017, um, there were some, a number of presentations that Jennifer Lynn did together with us in a number of venues. Um, Crossref um, has identified annotation as one of the new uh, potential DOI use cases. Um, another of these cases, for example, um, you know, individual comments by reviewers as part of the uh, peer review process. So um, we are in uh, discussions 
uh, about what best practices around DOIs for annotations might be. Um, so if you have thoughts on that, we'd love to hear from you, uh, particularly um, you know, to make annotations um, citable, um, annotations as research objects as part of um, faculty work. Um, we're doing uh, some work with ORCID. Uh, in some cases, you might want particular annotations that you've made, for example, to, to roll up to your ORCID. Um, so there's a number of great um, inter-industry collaborations on, around that time. Great, Heather. And uh, another question that sort of queued up um, here in the background is around the EJ Press use case that you were showing um, with AGU. And um, the, the questioner is especially wondering if they're already using annotations for peer review comments, or is there another use case or other use cases going on with EJ Press? Yeah, um, all of the manuscript submission systems operate, you know, a little bit differently. So in the case of um, EJ Press, um, they took the, they have the, the hypothesis um, functionality, uh, but they've tied it um, very specifically into their dashboard. So there's a number of things that they created that are useful in particular for, for peer review. Um, uh, different levels of permissions and roles, for example, so that the journal editor can see who the multiple reviewers are, but they cannot see who each other uh, are. And, um, and at a certain point, adding in the author, um, the ability to, to do a single blind and double blind um, of those different permission roles. Uh, also, eJournal Press wanted um, a defined tag set um, to be uh, easily implemented, uh, major revision, minor revision, problem with a figure, uh, such as examples like that. Um, and, and, and probably most pertinent to this question, they wanted to offer the reviewers a choice uh, between using the traditional review process where you returned a Word document that said on page five, paragraph four, line two, you said, which meant you had to chase it down, see what that was, um, versus um, making that comment actually on page five, paragraph four, sentence two. So um, both the reviewer and the author um, have some flexibility within their system. They can um, look at the reviewer comments uh, in uh, on top of the article itself, or they can pull up what's called a, a, a review summary, which basically um, you know lists uh, lists those issues. So the very very early data, uh, we had a call um, with um, Joel in I want to say very beginning of December. Um, and they did have a number of peer reviewers, um, you know, who were using it. Um, and we're looking forward to, you know, additional data that comes out of that. If you're working with a, a manuscript submission system other than, than eJournal Press, um, you know, we have initiated conversations with, with Scholar One, Editorial Manager, you know, River Valley, uh, Bench Press, you know, so, um, you know, just, just r remind them that this is a conversation that, uh, you know, could be useful for you. and. Um, in, in most cases, they take the open source code um, and build it into the systems themselves. So it's not something that um, needs to be scheduled on our roadmap or anything. Um, it's something that they can just do. So it looked like there was um, a question about costs. And um, I just wanted to clarify that the little example I showed where we just dropped the, the, um, the JavaScript into the template, is, that's entire, that would be entirely free. Um, if you want to do a deeper level integration, uh, you know, where uh, the kinds of things that, that Heather showed in the second part of, of the, uh, the presentation, uh, that would probably involve some costs. It would depend, you know, we'd, it would depend on the project, it would depend, you know, exactly what we were doing. But uh, at, the, at that simple level that I showed, that's entirely free. Yes, and as an open source um, company, you know that's one of the you know the great uh, benefits um, that is uh, is available you know to the community um, is that you can you can take the code and and you can you know implement annotation. It's important to remember that when you do that, um, those annotations that are made um, in the public layer are going to be visible to you know anyone who comes to your content. If there's a problem with one of those annotations, um, they can be flagged. Hypothesis operates as the moderator for those public annotations. So a key differentiator between just enabling the, um, the client to be visible and incorporating a publisher group um, like we're building for, um, uh, for eLife and, and, and some other publishers at the moment, you know, is that the control is in the hands of the publisher 
um, moderator or moderators um, as the publisher wishes. And that multi-layered um, option where you can have both groups that anyone can participate in, but also groups that are limited, uh, say to the authors or to, to staff. That is something that um, we charge for. Um, we think it's important that publishers of you know, any size should be able to work with annotation. So we have a, a simple pricing model that goes by how many documents you publish in a year um, as a proxy for publisher size. I mean, some, some groups use um, you know, you know, different re revenue bands. Um, we look at the number of documents you publish per year, uh, but we have conversations about, again, what you're trying to achieve and how many documents you wanna deploy across. So you can certainly deploy across um, just a, a, a small range of uh, books or you know, one journal at a time or even a particular part of, of one journal. Um, you know, that's, that's up to you. It can be that precise. Um, and the pricing uh, does include um, essentially unlimited publisher groups and layers um, there, uh, connection to your own accounts, if that's something that you wish. And we do have certain, um, you know, customizations that are available uh, right now. Um, and you can, you can, if you wanted to deploy hypothesis across all of your content, we would look at how many documents you put out um, in a year but that pricing would cover deployment of on your content back, you know, back to the beginning of, of time um, and no additional charge, um, as well as the, the training and um, success uh, programs that I referred to. Uh, Heather, you might just also clarify, um, you know, uh, as a nonprofit open source organization, uh, you know, why Hypothesis charges fees and, and what those go to support. Yeah, so um, we are a nonprofit, um, and we uh, believe in supporting an annotation ecosystem overall. It's one of the key reasons that we worked with the W3C to get the standard approved, um, because we, from the earliest days of the web, um, the idea that people could add their own information and comments was envisioned, but it took a while for technology to actually, you know, catch up with um, the, the desires and the wishes um, that, that people have. Uh, we started the Annotating All Knowledge Coalition a couple of years ago. It now numbers more than 70 publishers, universities, and tech companies that feel that annotation um, and open, particularly open and interoperable annotation is important. Um, we also run um, the largest uh, industry conference around annotation. It's called I Annotate. Um, this year it's the, I think it's the fifth, sixth, and seventh of, um, May, of June. Sorry, it's usually in May. This year it's in June. It'll be in San Francisco. Uh, we can send you information on that. Um, so as a, a community driven and you know, mission driven organization, um, you know, we feel that the, the, the code base um, should be available to all for them to contribute. But in order to do that effectively, we need to be able to you know, be sustainable on our side. Um, so scholarly com communications is one of the market segments that we're working with. Education is another, and you know, there's probably some others coming along the line. When we're coming up with our pricing, you know, we're doing it based on you know what a particular publisher's proportion of the entire scholarly output might be. Um, that's where we're starting from. Um, you know, we want things uh, to be sustainable from that side. Um, if you want something that we already have available, uh, there's no additional charge. If you want something that we don't have available, we can certainly you know have a discussion about uh, prioritizing that on the roadmap, but that would be um, additional. You know, and uh, there's uh, no other open questions right now, but somebody had asked a little bit of detail, kind of very specific technical detail on the W3C web annotation standards. And I've linked them to the blog post on the Hypothesis blog that uh, first announced the um, standards being published. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I wanna just mention, that there's a lot of technical detail behind those standards um, that hasn't, uh, you know, they've only been alive for a year. So not every annotation service out there in the world is already conforming to every, uh, every part of the standards and the standards themselves uh, will uh, mature as, as they move on. Um, there are specific um, components of the standard that do relate to the kind of role that an annotation plays 
in a text page, um, which was what the questioner was asking about specifically. And so there is a, a specific uh, kind of vocabulary word within the standards that has to do with the purpose or role of the annotation. And that may be related to what, what the questioner was thinking about, but I invite folks to go ahead and explore uh, the, the link to see the full vocabulary and standards that were published by the W3C. Heather, I don't know if you wanted to add any other comments to that. I just wanted to say that, you know, talking to publishers and, you know, uh, folks in the space, you know, we don't have to sell you on standards, you know, that should be a no brainer. But um, our vision for that, you know, annotation ecosystem, you know, is such that um, we think annotation should work like email. Um, and we all don't have the same email client, but we can email each other if we needed a separate account every time we needed to email someone on a different um, uh, annotate or email service, it would become quickly unwieldy. So um, the success of annotation in general, um, you know, will largely be determined by the uptake on the standard. So we are excited that there are other um, annotation uh, services out there um, looking at and, and, and working towards the standard. Um, right now, if you are looking at, uh, the, one of the reasons why comments really have not been successful, one is that they're siloed on sites and closed off. There's no way to, you know, interact with them uh, across the, the web and, and using um, different services. So, um, you know, it should be, it should be pretty good everyone on this call, but, um, you know, the, the success really is, uh, you know, on interoperable uh, and we can all work together to make that happen. Thanks. You know, we uh, we seem to have run out of questions with folks. I've invited them to ask more. Um, and I'll just mention, if anybody's thinking of something else they'd like to talk about, that uh, you will receive an email um, within a day that links to a post that contains both the recording of the webinar and a link to the slides that were used in it, as well as links to any um, websites that were mentioned during the course of the webinar. So you'll be able to visit that, and that's a public page that you'll be able to share with other folks in your organization or, or, uh, or colleagues at other publishers as well. Okay. We'll give um, Pub Factory the last word. Yeah. Uh, sure, thanks. We uh, uh, to, to let us <laughs> present here today. Oh, no, it's great. Um, yeah, and uh, thanks everybody for joining. I hope this proved useful. Please do reach out if you have further questions. Uh, we'd love to talk to you about it. We think it's really exciting technology. <laughs>